With it being Black History Month, we are looking at an all-time Seton Hall Pirate on the basketball court and someone that we can look to in the fight for the end of systemic racism and the fight for equality in our society. I'm John Fanta, Seton Hall University class of 2017, graduate from the College of Communication and the Arts, and we are joined by three wonderful pirates in different ways here today. First off, it is the University Archivist, Alan Delosier, who's the author of the book, Seton Hall Pirates, A Basketball History. And if you have not read that yet, you have got to because it's got great history in there. We also have a former pirate men's basketball student athlete from 1994 to 98, and now is a professor of sociology, Amanu Jackie Kaba, joining us as well. And finally, the great Mo Mirgahari is with us. Mo is the Tom and Ruth Sharkey Distinguished Visiting Scholar and the co-author of the article, Gentle Giant, Walter Duke's Legacy Lives On in Seton Hall Lore. So we are talking about the one and only Walter Dukes, whose number five is retired for Seton Hall basketball. He was the NIT MVP back in 1953 as the Pirates took home the championship. And let's start here with what that era was like for Seton Hall basketball leading into Walter's time at the Hall. Alan, tell us a little bit about where the program was leading into Walter's time. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here with my fellow uh, panelists. I'll just give you a little bit of a prehistory up to 53. 1941, picture it. Seton Hall's first appearance in the National Invitational Tournament, led by our very first All-American, Bob Davies. And there is a connection to Walter Dukes, which is wonderful. We didn't, unfortunately, win the NIT in 41, but uh, Bob Davies was drafted by the then Rochester Royals of the um, BAA, Basketball Association of America. And living in Rochester, he tended to um, frequent a lot of businesses downtown in Rochester. And he happened upon the dry cleaning establishment with this lovely lady who owned it. And she had a son named Walter Dukes. So they got to talking, um, Walter Dukes being uh, 6'11", an athlete, basketball player. And Bob actually recommended Seton Hall to him and the rest is history, so to speak. Fast forward to 1953. Bob Davies, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Walter Dukes was a senior. And the campus was alive with basketball fever. I mean, it was like 89, 1989 for later generations and actually last year and this year for uh, current Setonians. With that said, 1953, 27 game winning streak, um, high rating in the um, polls, the UPI, the AP. Um, and it was interesting because they, as you mentioned before, Walter Dukes was the M MVP of the NIT tournament. And just even before that time, they were highly regarded within not only metropolitan circles, but throughout the country. And 53 on campus too, not only was the excitement there, but actually the university was growing. So it was like a very incredible time. 7,000 students on campus, the uh, dormitory Boland Hall was built and the science building was gonna be uh, featured next uh, year on campus. So with all that together, Walter Dukes and of course the late Richie Regan, amazing individual, um, you know, set the trend for 53 in that tremendous memorable season. Let's talk a little bit about Walter's recruitment to Seton Hall. Mo, tell us about the stories in which Honey Russell starts to recruit Walter Dukes and how that all came to fruition. Uh, well, as Alan said, uh, Bobby Davies, our, our former Hall of Famer and playing for the Rochester Royals, was the one who identified Walter. And, you know, uh, learning more about Walter, he was 6'5 as a sophomore, 6'7 as a junior, and then sprouted up to seven feet. On top of it, you know, back then the big men were George Mikan and these guys who were kind of just in a low post who probably didn't know how to move as agile as anybody else. And Walter was a competitive track runner. So you have Honey Russell, who, you know, played his days in the, in the Barnstormer Leagues and, you know, real gritty player and was told basically, as Alan said, that this guy is a, definitely talent. Um, you know, Walter wasn't the first African-American player at Seton Hall, uh, as Bobby Hurt was, who was also a, a star in his own right. So Seton Hall had already kind of built this kind of establishment of bringing in players. It wasn't as closed off as a lot of other schools and recruited him to bring him down. 
when he did come, he played at Seton Hall Prep in his first two years. And, um, you know, they did phenomenal with Bobby Hurd on that team, Richie Regan on that team. And Walter more and more grew into the dominance that he was. And I think Honey, being the Hall of Fame coach that he was, was able to see that and knew that this, you know, Walter Dukes is going to be not only a star, but a, a legend in Seton Hall lore, as they would say. Um, and I think the thing that a lot of people don't realize is he was Walt, you know, Wilt Chamberlain before Wilt Chamberlain, Kareem before Kareem. You know, I'm sure if he uh, went one on one with George Mike and he would have probably given him a good run for the money then too as a high school or college player as well. Just fascinating stuff uh, about the, the history there and to be featured in the conversation with the greats is something that we'll reflect on in terms of what Walter actually did throughout his career. But Jackie, I want to bring you in here now for the perspective on coming to Seton Hall University. To start, you were coming from Africa, and I'm just curious what the process of it was like coming to the States and then your recruitment process from your coach, P.J. Carlisabo. Well, it's, it's really interesting that um, we are talking about uh, Walter Dukes, and he was 6'11", and it just happened that I'm also 6'11", so in a sense, I'm like the flesh, I'm his flesh, his body sitting here while you talk about him. So that's very interesting um, that it just happened this way. Um, I went to high school for two years in Washington, DC. Um, I came in 1992. And so I played for two years at St. John's College High School in Washington, DC. And so that's where I was recruited by PJ Calissimo. So he actually came to visit us during practice. And, and he, he, he recruited me. He said he wanted me to play for him. Um, I came and visited the school. The school was very small, which was something I was looking forward to. I wanted a small campus. And I was also interested in the United Nations. And the United Nations is right here in New York City. And so then I said, this makes sense for me to come here because I would like to work at the UN someday. And I can play on a campus that's also very small, playing for a great coach. And, and the, the, the guys on the team were very nice to me also when I came to visit Adrian, um, John Leahy, and so they were very, very nice. So it was just a very easy decision for me. That's awesome stuff. We'll continue to talk about your journey. And looking back now to the Walter Dukes era, the 1952-53 season for Seton Hall basketball was a program-changing one, Alan. They end up being number one midseason. They win the NIT championship. Give us a taste and a feel of – how Seton Hall was able to climb all the way up to being the best in the country and what it was like around South Orange, New Jersey. Okay, my pleasure, John. And actually, I should say, with Jackie's perspective and Mohammed's perspective, it's all part of the Seton Hall history story, you know, Walter Dukes going forward. And, you know, just looking back, this is exciting because I bring up 1989 again. Um, I don't know if anybody was here for that event and I heard about it secondhand, but apparently South, South Orange Avenue was a mob scene when the team returned and had a um, victory party for them. You know, even though they fell short, you know, the effort was incredible. And 53 was the same way. And even though the 89 team came from Seattle back to New Jersey and, you know, basically the uh, 1953 team played Madison Square Garden, they just had to come over the uh, GW Bridge or the Hollow Under Lincoln Tunnel. Um, it was basically euphoric in terms of what I've read and the documentation that survives today. Um, and I should point out too, that we've um, I've seen various video clips. Of course, the great Marty Glickman, who was an announcer at that time, who was actually a, a adjunct professor at Seton Hall for a year or two, um, you know, touted it from a national perspective. So basically, you know, the success and the uh, excitement on South Orange's campus, um, radiated out throughout New Jersey, the metropolitan area and throughout the country. So with, with the NIT being the pre preeminent uh, tournament at that time. So, you know, I can't say enough about how that factored in and how it went forward. And even just, um, just a quick uh, aside, before the 52-53 season, um, Seen Hall's trajectory went up when Walter Dukes was in the uh, varsity lineup, 24-7 um, and seven in 1950-51 and 25 and three in 1915-52. And each year, including 53, they were in the final um, UPI and API rankings, very high up in terms of their uh, um, final standings and also NIT appearances each year. So basically excitement abounded in South Orange and beyond for the Seat Hall Pirates. Jackie, 
I yes. wanted to follow up with you because I'm, I'm hearing all these things about you talking about the fact that you almost feel like you're talking in the flesh uh, of Walter being six foot 11 as well. And Alan's bringing up all these historic numbers and all the greatness of Walter Dukes. And we heard Mo talk about, you know, some of the names, Bill Russell and, and Will. Had you heard about Walter Dukes, Jackie? Before I came, no. Um, but interestingly, when I arrived, Richard Reagan used to be on campus all the time and he just fell in love with me and he kept coaching me. And that's when he kept bringing Walter Dukes, Walter Dukes telling me to keep my hands up whenever I catch the ball. And I was not able to do that until my last year playing. So if you go back and look up the videos of my games, it was my senior year. That was the final time I could like do what Richard Reagan was telling me to do because he said, that's what Walter used to do, that I must always keep the ball above my head. But it took, it took me time, um, but he was very nice to me. So he told me a lot about Walter Dukes because he was on campus all the time and he was just a great, great human being uh, in terms of giving me advice and, and, and coaching me. Mo, let's look back at that season again in 1952-53. So Seton Hall's the number one team in the country. They're 27 and 0 heading into March. Just amazing. Simply amazing. And the team goes on a trip to Dayton and Louisville. Can you tell us what happened on that trip? Well, everything off the research and everything I've seen, I mean, up to date, um, Seton Hall had not played as far as Philadelphia. If you look at their, their schedule, they played mostly at the Walsh Gym, the Armory in New York, uh, Rose Hill where Fordham played. And they never actually ventured outside, I would say, the tri-state area. Uh, Seton Hall actually had beat both Louisville and Dayton earlier in the season as well. And pretty soundly too, I think by 11 or 10 points for each game. So I think it was a combination of things, uh, obviously going to Dayton, you know, the Richie Regan and, you know, one of his coaches, he said one game was stolen and one game was hard earned. And I think the Dayton game was hard earned, but they ran into issues when they arrived in the Dayton, they had to stay on the bus. Uh, there was another player, um, that wasn't allowed to stay in the hotel as well. Frank Benaya, who was of Dominican descent, actually. So that game was actually pretty hard fought. Uh, there were some things. But then when they went to Louisville is actually where all the racial animus and hatred came out. Um, obviously, it was, you know, the first time that season they had been to the South. Uh, Walter, you know, would get called for fouls before the, the whistle and tip even happened. And you saw it's 7,500 people, you know, against 12. And we saw the, the team had to stay on the train for the night. They weren't allowed to stay at the hotel. And, you know, we, uh, Seton Hall and, you know, Richie Regan used to say too, it, we're New Jersey players and we're gritty. And I think that with the combination of all the, the hatred that was towards Walter and, and Frank kind of really spilled onto the court. Uh, you know, if you look in the Time Life magazine, there's these disturbing images of our players laid out, what they're doing to Walter. And, you know, they ripped the, his miraculous medal off his neck and, they were coming for him and, you know, for just being a team and, you know, just the priests were their bodyguards and I don't know how much bodyguard training they get, but they really had to get Walter out of there before things really got ugly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that was where, you know, those two losses really came, you know, the impact because otherwise if you had played those probably in the New York area, they would have been 29 and 0. Uh, and I think lastly, it's, you know, the era then people don't realize, Jackie Robinson was only just a few years before that, right? And Brown uh, versus Ed hadn't happened. Louisville had just desegregated, uh, but there was parts of the city that was still whites only. So that that city was way behind the times, and you know they were still living in a in a different era. And they when they see Walter Dukes, who I think averaged uh, twenty six and twenty two that season, coming in and, and dominating in that game at Louisville, he put on a, a show. You know, the, the people there just bring it out and it brings out the worst of them. Yeah, your article mentions that gentle giant Walter Duke's legacy lives on in Seton Hall lore. And in that article, I, I find what you just said so enlightening. Jackie, to Mo's point, Mo talks about the fact that the teammates, yes. his coaches, were supportive. They were there for him mm -hmm. during those moments of adversity, of, of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you say about the bond of a team and the importance of it at a time like that? Um, that's, that's, that's great because um, by the time I got to see the whole university, um, most of the players, the majority of the players were already black. So my experience was different than compared to Walter Duke's experience. Um, but again, coming from another country, I was very fortunate to have like really 
great teammates. I could just go to their rooms whenever I felt like. Um, they took me out. Um, they were very nice to me. Um, I mean, I think because of them, that was the reason why I was able to even graduate in three years and actually use my fourth year of scholarship for my first year of grad school, you see? And so I had, I had no stress whatsoever. Um, so it was great to have that, to have people around me who were supportive and, and, and it's like a family, that's really what it is. And I remember um, my second book, when I published my second book, I, I, I had the chance to um, acknowledge so many other people. But interestingly, I ended up um, thanking my teammates and dedicating my second book on the WNBA and the NBA to my teammates. So that tells you everything. If I can do my second book and I could have acknowledged or dedicated to anyone else, but I dedicated it to my teammates and my, my, my coaches. And so that says it all because I was in a family and I believe I'm here today going all the way back to what uh, 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 the, the legacy of Walter Dukes. And so that's why I was saying in the beginning that in a way I'm sitting back right here again. It's like he never left, he really never left. And, but now we are talking about his legacy and I'm an example in terms of the struggles that he went through for someone like me to tell you the experiences that I'm having now. And to that point on what it's been like in the now, bringing this back to where we are in present day, where we've been as, as a country, we have work to do. And, and I'm just, it, it brings up that point, Jackie, of what I look at this year, actually, in college basketball, is a lot of teams, coaches, student athletes, all speaking out for what is right. Just as we do this conversation, the Seton Hall men's basketball program is talking about the human race. They put out a video earlier today talking about how important it is to come together during these times. What's the sociological aspect that you see, Jackie, in sports and how it can not only bring people together, but build society up? It's really true, right? Um, I've told my students that I said religion, um, sports, entertainment, right? And musicians, right? Tend to bring people together, right? Um, and, and that's what we are seeing. I believe that's what we are seeing. Um, I think what's going on also, uh, I think it's the right time and you can tell it's the right time. If you look at what happened with the, with, uh, what happened last year, last summer with the Black Lives Matter protest, it was very encouraging to see religious leaders, corporate leaders, politicians supporting Black Lives Matter and, 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 and actually some of them matching with them um, in Washington DC and other parts, of the, other parts of the country. And then there was a public opinion poll that actually showed that 60% of Americans supported uh, um, Black Lives Matter. And then the, the numbers were even higher for various ethnic and racial groups um, in the country. And then during the election, the presidential election, for Democrats, for example, over about 90% of them said that civil rights equality was very important to their vote. And so that's a huge number when you have um, 80 million or more people voting for the Democratic Party. Let's go back to 1953 again, as we continue to honor the great Walter Duke. So in 1953, Alan Seton Hall, we talked about that, that road trip that they had to Dayton and Louisville. They take a loss there, but they're still one of the very best teams in the nation. And they accept an invitation to the NIT, National Invitation Tournament. But the NIT carries a different definition back then than what it does here today in 2020, 2021. Explain that, Alan. Okay, I'd be happy to. And just like, um, you know, going off of what Mohammed said about the adversity that Walter Dukes faced, you know, against Louisville, and also what Jackie said about us being beneficiaries of the great history, their two perspectives are really important. And then looking back at 53, the National Invitational Tournament, interestingly enough, was um, the brainchild of um, Madison Square Garden. It came out of um, what was called at that time and even today, the Mecca of college basketball. But I'll just go back a couple more years. Sorry, the historian in me has all these, uh, <laughs> these tie-ins. So thanks for bearing with me. There was a gentleman named Ned Irish in 1933-34, who was a, a newspaper reporter. And he found that Madison Square Garden on most nights was empty. At this time, the uh, New York Rangers and the New, New York Americans were playing hockey most nights. And this was before the NBA or BAA came into existence. And he had an idea about colleges, especially the local uh, New York uh, area colleges, or as I call it, the North Metropolitan area. 
in terms of Seton Hall and the other schools within the city proper. He said that, you know, this would be a great idea to maybe bring intersectional contest into uh, the Vogue, basically inviting teams from the Midwest and West East to play at Madison Square Garden because New York City was a great attraction for any school throughout the country. And fast forward four more years, 1938 was the very first uh, National Invitational Tournament. Um, it was won by Temple, so an Eastern school you know, dominated. But I should point out too, there was another leg, the NAIA, which is still in existence today. It's kind of um, a little bit more low key than the NCAA, but they had their uh, final tournament a year before their very first. And then the NCAA tournament that we know today, March Madness came a year after. And something interesting about the NIT too, um, you, you, you probably heard about John Wooden, the wizard of Westwood, tremendous coach, tremendous motivator, tremendous individual. Before he coached at UCLA, he coached at Indiana State and he brought his team to um, the NAIA championship. And he was the first to integrate postseason college basketball. And the NIT followed suit a couple of years later, just in time for Walter Dukes and actually Bobby Hurd as well to um, participate. So great thing going on there. Then we go to the NIT. Essentially, it was a premier college basketball tournament from its inception in 1938 until 1971, when the NCAA required that conference tournaments, I'm sorry, conference winners and others had to select the NCAA first over the NIT. And just actually a year before, um, Al McGuire, who was from the New York metropolitan area, brought Marquette. He had the option of going to either. He chose the NIT. So we can put those as the time uh, markers um, in terms of the NIT and its importance. And again, Madison Square Garden, it was the media capital of the world as well. So a lot of media attention coming in New York City that radiated out throughout the country. Um, and actually around that time period too, uh, Seton Hall was a regular on local television, WPIX, and on the radio, WNJR out of Newark. So it was a natural fit in terms of Seton Hall, the NIT, and also schools from not only the East, but across the country coming in and having memorable tournaments and making history in the process. Mo, what happens when the Pirates get to the NIT? Well, I think the Pirates were, were looking at their next opponent. They happened to be in the same bracket as Louisville, and I think they were thirsty for a little revenge. So they had a, a slump game against Niagara, which they only won by five points. And I think they were just looking forward. And I'm sure a, a great Hall of Fame coach like Honey Russell was more upset they were looking forward than looking at it now. Uh, Louisville got knocked off, which, you know, probably was a just desserts because they didn't, uh, I, in my opinion, deserve to be there after what had happened to Louisville. But uh, Seton Hall and Walter Dukes and Richie and everyone went on to, to crush Manhattan next. I think it was 74 to 56. Uh, and then they won against St. John's, uh, which kind of seems to be a trend for Seton Hall, uh, and winning the national championship. Uh, on top of that, Walter was the MVP. I mean, Walter was the NIT MVP. The team had won, and it was one of the greatest uh, victories that you'd seen. Uh, a great story, you know, the team went 31-2. and two. Uh, was that the local mayor had invited all the coaches to a big dinner hosting Seton Hall. And every coach attended the dinner except the coach from Louisville. So, um, you know, to me, it, it's, you know, a great story. And, you know, someone like Walter and Richie and all the guys on that team deserve and they deserve that national championship. It's just a, a remarkable, remarkable story. And uh, what a story for the Pirates to fight through those different things that go beyond basketball and come out champions on the court and even beyond uh, what happens in the score of a game. Alan, I'm curious here. His number is retired, number five. He was an All-American, a consensus All-American. He was the NIT MVP. He became a two-time All-Star professionally. Where does Walter Dukes rank among the all-time Seton Hall greats? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I'd say Jackie is one of them, but also Walter Dukes in terms of um, all-time greats. I'd say he'd be up there, depending upon who you ask, um, in the top three, maybe even the greatest ever. Based on the numbers. That? Based on yeah. the numbers. Also his impact, of course, the NIT championship. And actually, you know, if um, I'd say as a, um, as a student athlete too, 
because a lot of people don't know that um, he was very well-rounded. And I, I put this into the factor as well of the area of student athlete. I'll just read you some of the things he was involved with, along with being a standout basketball player. He was a member of the uh, business club, interracial council, philosophy circle, marketing club, insurance club, and the Spanish club in between um, playing on the court and also classes. But overall, he was, uh, at the time of his graduation, only one of three members of the Thousand Point Club with our friend and uh, you know, hero, Richie Regan, and Pep, Frank Pep Saul from the uh, late 40s. So, and just the numbers were astounding and first team consensus All-American. On top of those things, just thinking about some of the other things that Walter Dukes did. Of course, got his bachelor's degree from Seton Hall. He gets drafted by the Knicks. He played, of course he did. He played for the Harlem Globetrotters before going to the NBA, as if he didn't have enough already on his resume. And he was a, a, a two-time All-Star, as we said, with the Pistons. But he also then, folks, went on to earn his law degree at NYU and was successful as a civil rights attorney and in real estate. This man did it all. He's a perfect representation of Seton Hall University. And going back to you, Jackie, we're hearing about how Walter made the most and how he, he went above and beyond in his student athlete experience. What reflections do you have on the Seton Hall student athlete experience and how it builds you? Um, well, um... As student athletes, we are very fortunate. Uh, we are protected so, to some extent. And so for the most part, I, I told someone we do not go through the typical experience of um, ordinary students, right? Or regular students, um, because we are athletes. Um, so we have the opportunity to go to school all year round. For example, we just take classes. I remember when I came here, they just told me, you can take as many classes as you want all year round. And so that was the reason why I was able to graduate early. Um, when I wrote my book on the WNBA and NBA, I realized that there are tens of thousands of us or more who actually earn our bachelor's degrees or higher from being student athletes. But this goes back to what uh, Walter Dukes did in terms of opening the way for people like us. But it might not just be uh, those of us who are student athletes because sometimes by people seeing him on the college campus, that might have inspired other young people who are not even athletes, right? To also go to college. And as of right now, um, as of 2019, I mean, I like to look at the glass half full. I can, only, it's always good in my, in my work. You know, I, 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 I call myself uh, in terms of my research. I believe that I'm an activist, but I do so through my research. Um, but I also like to look at the glass half full. As of 2019, December, 2019, there are 5.23 million Black Americans or Black people in this country, age 18 or over, with at least a bachelor's degree. 5.23 million people. So at least there are good things happening, if you look at it from that point of view. In 2019, 3,095 Black or Black Americans got their doctorates in this country. Now, some of them went into debt all the way up to their eyeballs to pay for it, but it's always, it's, it's always good to go into debt to get your education, especially when it's doctorates. And so I, I like looking at the glass half full. So I think what he did, being a civil rights uh, uh, and lawyer, for example, representing people agitating, fighting for, for, for the rights or equality, I think that has contributed to the numbers that I'm giving you now. In 1970, for example, only 4.4% of African-Americans age 25 and over had at least a bachelor's degree, 4.4%. In 2019, 16% of the number I just gave you, 5.23 million, uh, age 18 or more had at least a bachelor's degree. So you see, that's a big, big improvement. So at least we are not stagnant or we're not going backwards. We are going forward as we continue to perfect the union as, 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 as we all say. And you are so humble, Jackie, because you talk about the, the book uh, with the NBA and WNBA, but you have almost 80 scholarly publications, six books, 50 full-length scholarly journal art articles. So all of those classes at Seton Hall University said, you could take a class whenever you'd like. I, I think it might have paid off. Yes, it did. And it's so interesting that now I have student athletes in my courses and they've probably find me to be one of the strictest um, professors. 
And so it's very interesting, including men basketball players, but yet they find me to be very, very strict. And so it's very interesting. We live in a very interesting world. Mo, how does Walter Dukes continue to inspire you today and in our future? I mean, Walter's story, you know, and I, I kind of never gave how I ran across it. Uh, after 9-11, uh, heard some things, name was Muhammad, and I was working in the athletic department, and someone actually handed me the Time Life magazine and said, hey, take a look at some real adversity. And reading and learning about what happened to Walter, I mean, is a lesson for everybody from now and through the time that he went through that. And I think one of the things that Seton Hall made so attractive to Walter that makes so attractive to our student athletes now, our men's basketball players is our area in New North Jersey, New York is a, a state full of first generation Americans. Richie was a first generation American and I got to know him when he used to come by the athletic department, like Jackie said all the time. And I mean, these guys were brothers and I think that's the biggest difference. And I think Walter's story and persevering through everything he went, if you look at the video clips, uh, of the championship they're on YouTube and some other places, the whole crowd is more or less white. The games were still segregated. The games in Walsh, I believe, were, I'm not, I'm not sure. But, you know, Walter was able to rise above that. He was able to play through all that and then led a great career. And then, like you said, went on to do things in the civil rights arena. And I think being an inspiration, not only for all the student athletes, but just students in the younger generation as well. I mean, if they could follow into a quarter of what Walter accomplished in the stand up, for everybody, I think is a big piece. Uh, we see our student athletes, we see athletes in general standing up and they do have a voice and it's what does that voice help us accomplish and what does it do? So I think, you know, from a standpoint, you know, the, the Big East has done great to be able to, to work with student athletes. Seton Hall has done great. And I think this is something that just helps to accelerate and bring us all together even more and hopefully open up more opportunities and more understanding amongst each other. Alan, going off that point with the history of Seton Hall University uh, and with the, the history that Walter Duke's inspiration provides us as the university archivist, how would you say the, the linkage is when you think about Walter, the impact that he had, how he overcame adversity and, and how you kind of see that in perspective of Seton Hall University history? Great, thanks, John. And I just want to say with um, you know, Mohammed's piece on Walter Duke's, Amazing, I've learned so much from it. And this ties into your question, along with Jackie's um, publications in terms of being a faculty colleague and in terms of like the overall sports and you know the, uh, the height of African-Americans in today's world. We can go back to Walter Dukes and also a few other athletes in Seton Hall's history. Um, you may have heard the names um, uh, Phil Thigpen and um, Andy Stanfield. Track stars par excellence, you know, um, in terms of the track history of Seton Hall, don't worry, I'm coming back to the main point in a moment. But um, we've only had about three head coaches of the track team in 100 years, including the legendary John Moon currently. Andy Stanfield and Philip Thigpen were um, phenomenal runners, all Americans. They won a number of track meets and Andy Stanfield won a gold medal at the uh, Helsinki Olympics in 1952. So this was at the time, they were classmates of Walter Dukes. And on the basketball front, you mentioned John Bobby Hurd a moment ago. If I may, I just want to read a passage from the 1949-50 media guide, the time period. Um, it's called Press Radio and Television Information. So it's, good, it's very short, but it gives a really good perspective on how important he was, not only to the program, but to the school. And uh, I quote, here's a lad. And I should point out that the uh, sports information uh, director at that time was O. Lawrence Keefe, another legendary figure in Seton Hall history, and he called everybody lad. So Bobby Hurd, here's a lad to tab as a coming star. He has everything to because he has everything to become one of the standouts for the next three years. Not only is he a lad with that certain something which pleases the crowd, but he's an all-around court performer. His one handlers, one handers are almost impossible to stop. He has remarkable ba ball handling ability. It was Hurt who led Orange High to the Group Four title two years ago, and he was regarded as the state's best player. Sorry for the um, pauses there, but Group Four in New Jersey basketball, highest level. Bobby Hurt, Walter Dukes, and those who came after him, 
including Jackie and others, and very important in terms of the overall, the overall history of Seton Hall athletics and university history. Jackie, I'll have you wrap this up for us and, and shed some light here because you, I'm just thinking about the fact that you're able to tie back to what Walter Dukes was able to do, Seton Hall greatness, basketball greatness, uh, greatness in humanity. Yes. And now you are teaching, you are with the future, the future leaders, all the different people that, that we are going to rely upon here to help us into our future generations. Of course, I hope that we're only going to build, like you were saying, we have to keep on building up. Jackie, what can you say? What would be your message here during these times to all the Seton Hall students, the student athletes, to everyone in the Seton Hall University community about the legacy that we see in Walter and how we can apply it going forward in our lives? Well, I, I am optimistic um, and I tell my students that also. And I also show it to them in terms of how hard I work for them. Um, so for example, last year, I was telling my current students because I teach a course research methods, I spent over 200 hours working with my students, right? Apart from teaching, just meeting with them on the phone, uh, using Microsoft Teams, just to help them with their research. And, and many of them actually remember that. And I believe that's something that they are gonna remember in the future to say, um, he did not care whether I was white, whether I was female, whether I was Asian. He just kept working and working and working with me until now I feel very good about myself in terms of being a social scientist and being a researcher, doing social science research. Um, so I'm very optimistic about the future. We have, we have not so good things that have happened, right? It's out there, that's what we are talking about. Um, but going back to Cedar Hall University as someone, for example, who attended a Catholic institution in Africa, here in Washington, DC, in the United States, and then now Cedar Hall University, um, I've told my students that there is a unique relationship between Black people and the Catholic institution itself, right? It's not perfect, right? But I was just telling you in terms of the tens of thousands of um, student athletes who have earned their degrees from, from colleges and universities, where Catholic institutions, for some reason, are right there in terms of uh, awarding and uh, these this scholarships to uh, uh, minorities, for example, right? In terms of many of us getting our education at these institutions. And so I've always discussed this with my students, the unique relationship between uh, the, the church itself, um, but not just with, with um, blacks, for example, but other groups, right? Why, I tell my students, why is it that people from various religious groups, right? Regardless of the religion, regardless of the culture, tend to send their kids to Catholic high schools and Catholic colleges. Why did I select Cedar Hall? Why did I go to St. John's University? I could have gone to the University of Virginia. They recruited me and many other institutions recruited me. And so I'm very optimistic um, about the future. I believe we're in the right direction. And at the same time, I'm encouraged because for us to move forward, it's also good for us to remember what happened in the past. Um, but the one great thing is we have great leaders who have left strong legacies for us. And so if you talk about Dr. King, right? I was just telling you about Black Lives Matter and you have politicians, corporate leaders, religious leaders marching with them. That's because they are nonviolent. And I've said, that's the reason why we have Kamala Harris as vice president right now. That's the reason why we had Barack Obama as president because of that legacy of Dr. King. And I'm optimistic that we are going forward, but it's also very important for us to, to know that we don't want to go back to the way things used to be, or we don't want to go through those experiences, or to find ways to deal with what happened in the past, because sometimes it's hard to move forward if you do not deal with what happened in the past. But overall, I'm very optimistic about the, about the future, about the country, about the world. Mo, oh, I know you had a follow-up to that. Well, I had a follow-up, but actually, uh, Jackie gave me another one. Uh, two things. Uh, <clears throat> when Walter graduated, he ended up converting to Catholicism, and Richie Regan was his at his baptism and his godfather. Um, and, you know, two other things I just wanted to bring up. Uh, the article I wrote, I, I did it with Charles Shepard, who was a renowned civil rights uh, reporter, covered John Lewis and his run, and, you know, helping me with the research. And you know, being, he's from Georgia and he's like, we didn't even hear these stories. And I was somebody who's involved. So a lot of times, even Walter's story in the Northeast is unique to the rest of the country. And I think that's why it's beneficial. And 
the students and everybody should know it because, you know, we always think of the things that happen in the South and Midwest. And I was very lucky to have uh, Scott be able to help me with the project. Uh, and finally, we talk about Walter's greatness. Um, he set the NCAA rebound record with 734 in a single season. Last year, the record holder was 232. So think about how great Walter was to set that type of record that stood for, you know, four decades. And, you know, I love Angel. I don't know if Angel got uh, as close to 734. Uh, but again, it's just something that, you know, I think we really have to see the, the dominance of this player and better as a human being even than a player as well to go through what he did. Which is unbelievable to think about when you think of the numbers he put up, what he did after basketball. Again, what an amazing man Walter Dukes was, larger than life, and his example lives on at Seton Hall University and beyond forever. I want to thank this wonderful, wonderful panel, Mohammed Mirgahari, who is the Tom and Ruth Sharkey Distinguished Visiting Scholar, co-author of the article. If you haven't seen it yet, it's on NCAAHoopsDigest.com, and uh, Mo has published it. It's co-author of Gentle Giant, Walter Duke's Legacy Lives On in Seton Hall Lore. It is a must, must read. Amadou Jackie Kaba, professor of sociology at Seton Hall University and a former pirate himself back in the 90s. And finally, it is always great to have university archivist Alan Delosier giving us a historical perspective. This has been great, gentlemen. I'm John Fanta, and I want to thank you all for taking the time today to honor a pirate legend and reflect here as we continue to look at Black History Month and its great impact.